Well, thanks, folks, for uh, coming tonight. And I do have the pleasure of introducing Ron Cowdais. He's much better looking than this picture, I'll tell you. <laughs> and his hand's not that big either. Um, uh, Ron's going to uh, hopefully tell us a bit about his work uh, and his life in landscape architecture. Uh, Ron's been at it for four also a uh, practitioner in Michigan and is registered as a landscape architect there. He's been president uh, of RKLA, as we lovingly call it at our office, but Ron Cowdice Landscape Architects uh, since 1984. Uh, that firm is still uh, going strong and uh, I think we'll probably hear not just past work but uh, current and work that's uh, coming up in the future. Uh, as I said, Ron's had over 40 years of experience uh, but mixed in with that has also been teaching. He uh, holds a Master's of Education uh, degree from the University of Toronto uh, and also a Bachelor of Landscape Architecture from the University of Guelph. Um, so I'm hopeful that Ron will be happy and joyful in his presentation because he's, he's looking very serious. But he, he said that's what he looks like before the big ideas come. So without further ado, Ron Cowkins. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, I, I wanted to look ruminating. <laughs> That's my rumination look. <laughs> I put this first slide up just to remind me to thank all of you, uh, my clients and uh, peers, associates, architects who I work with all the time. Uh, I wouldn't be standing here sharing my work with you if you didn't have faith in me and, and uh, involve me in your, in your project. So thank you. Uh, the last time I was standing here doing this was in 1993. I presented to the Architectural Association then on the topic of ethical landscapes. And the idea was, uh, do we have to live with lawns? Are there alternatives to the way we maintain a landscape? And it's interesting to think about how we think about the garden and think about the land today uh, compared to what it was like back in 1993. So it was, it was a, uh, I, I had to find my slides, actually. I had a slide carousel. You know what those are? <laughs> a Kodak projector. Uh, but I'm going to go back beyond that, uh, back to when the Canadian military liberated Holland. My, both my grandfathers were in concentration camps in Holland, in Germany. And after the war, the, uh, the uh, uh, Canadian troops marched in and liberated them. My family were near death, uh, starvation. Um, my, my mother thought they might live another week, and the, uh, uh, everything was lost. And so they thought, uh, what, what can we do? What, where is this land of hope? And because it was the Canadian troops that liberated them, they felt very predisposed to coming to Canada. And so they got on a ship and uh, came to Canada, landed in Halifax. But in order to come here uh, from Holland, you had to be either a farmer or a landscaper. And the Canadian government was trying to repopulate the rural areas because at that time, 80% of people lived on farms. And so many men were killed, they wanted to get that industry back on its feet and going again. So it's not, it's not by accident that many of the farms uh, are owned by Dutch people and many of the landscape companies are run by Dutch people. So that's where my roots come from. Uh, we had a landscape company and when I was eight years old, I was brought into the business to mow lawns and and rake leaves, we didn't have backpack bowers, everything had to be swept and, uh, and clipped by hand. That's my family's first truck. My grandfather's, that's my grandfather there. Uh, and that's his truck, Cornelius Verboom. Yeah, he was an interesting man who always worked with a small hat and dress shoes, even in the garden. And uh, very, very formal um, approach to his work and his attire. When I was in grade eight, I wrote the University of Guelph a letter and said, I want to be a landscape architect. What courses should I take in high school? Uh, I watched my uncles and my grandfather and my dad uh, slaving physical hard work in, in the nursery and in the, in the landscape business. And I thought, uh, I love the work, but uh, I'm not sure this is a career for life. Uh, and I was interested in design. So uh, the University of Guelph wrote, wrote me an interesting response 
basically said, doesn't matter what you take, just do well and we'll see you in five years. <laughs> so five years later I showed up, there I was at the University of Guelph, uh, becoming an Aggie and a Griffin, painting the cannon and going to school in the landscape architecture program. Meanwhile, I got married uh, while I was in school. Uh, I grew up in Niagara Falls, and uh, so where else would you have your wedding picture taken? But uh, at the Maid of the Mist dock, actually the Maid of the Mist sailed by. I cropped it out of this picture. Maid of the Mist sailed by and all these people were yelling at us, look over here, look over here. So we, we turned around and were waving at them. And about a year later, um, my mother said, you've got to go to the IMAX. And there we were on the IMAX waving at the Maid of the Mist <laughs> as bride and groom. But the, uh, the tux wasn't accidental. That was the thing to wear at the, uh, at the time. Uh, yeah. uh, in our, uh, my final year at Guelph, uh, we did an overseas elective, and we stayed in, uh, in London, England. Uh, I was privileged to have professors. Uh, these two, uh, Sir Jeffrey Jellicoe and Dame Sylvia Crowe, sort of the gods of landscape, uh, were my professors there. And I often think back to how stupid I was because I had no idea how important they were or what kind of questions to ask them. Uh, I really, I felt I squandered that opportunity uh, to, to be with them. And I studied at Kew Gardens uh, in the herbarium there and uh, did my thesis on historic English landscapes. Came back to Canada. Um, my wife uh, was finishing medical school. So I thought, okay, we'll spend a year here until she's done school and then we'll go back to Niagara Falls and enter into my family business. Uh, so while I was here, I managed the little tree farm. Some of you may remember the uh, little tree farm in Springbank Drive. And uh, I was the landscape manager there. Uh, but this man, David Cram, had come to London a year before. He was uh, from London and his, uh, his intent was to open a landscape architectural practice. No, there were no other landscape architectural practices here in London. At the time, there was one landscape architect, Bruce Henry, who worked at development engineering and eventually ended up at the city. Uh, so David was getting his practice going. The intent was a couple of his classmates were going to join him, but they bailed on him. And so he knew I was at Little Tree Farm and he called me and said, would you like to join my firm and, uh, and help me out here? And I thought, okay, well, I'll do it for a little while and then we're going back to Niagara Falls. This is where our office was. Uh, that's where my office was in that little bay window right there. This is the R.I. Harris building at the corner of Dufferin and Talbot Street. That's what's there now. That's the, uh, the new Azure uh, high rise. So my office would have been right there. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is our team. That's uh, Dave Cram, a client, and uh, this is one of my former students. That's my wife and a couple secretaries from next door. Happens to be David's birthday, so we're all pointing at him because it's his birthday. And yes, that's me, <laughs> if you believe it. A lot less hair today. Um, we had, uh, David was very politically connected, and Tom Gosnell was one of the people who was often in our office uh, talking about politics and planning strategies, um, you know, ways to improve the city, that kind of thing. You know Tom, he eventually became mayor from 1986 to 1994, and everybody in our office worked on his campaign to, uh, to help him get elected. It was, a, it was an interesting time in a different city back then. Population of London back then was only 250,000, so we've doubled in size over the course of my career. Parks and Recreation was under the PUC at the time, and they had one staff person, either Morris Chapman or John Lohais, uh, were the directors. They had one person underneath them. And so uh, if a park wanted to be developed, uh, they would call me in and we'd just have a chat about it and I'd do the design. Uh, there was no sort of infrastructure. We had to go through all these approvals. Site plan approval was one, land, one engineer who did site plan approval and I would bring my drawings in and sit down with him and say, uh, here's what I'm proposing to do. Uh, he didn't know anything about landscape or plants. As long as I had an Austrian pine and a Norway maple, he was fine. And uh, he would approve the drawings and off we go and build them. Uh, a lot different today. No landscape architect at the city at the time. But David and I got some really interesting projects. One was uh, Richard and Beryl Ivey's backyard. 
uh, it really catapulted us in, into, I think, credibility in the community. And uh, we designed uh, this garden. And over here is a little greenhouse that we designed as well. I'll come back to Richard and Barrow later. And uh, I see Gail is here. There's Gail Lamb. We uh, had a privilege of working on Ontario Place. Uh, this is what Ontario Place looked like in 1979. The, uh, the government of the day uh, wanted to solicit votes from the northern uh, parts of the province. And so they got this idea of developing an exhibit called Ontario North Now, and it would be built on the parking lot on the CNE. and uh, Unfortunately, when they first came to Gail and us, uh, there wasn't enough time to get building permits in place in, in time to build this thing. So we put our heads together and came up with the idea of building silos. We'll put a bunch of silos. Originally, they were going to be in the parking lot, uh, but the city decided, well, we're going to build these silos. We, we got this space at Ontario Place and put them out there. And silos, agricultural buildings, didn't require building permits. So we could just go and build them, and, uh, which is what we did. We, uh, we built this model. Actually, my dad, you know, uh, we got a lathe. We turned these things, cut out cardboard, and uh, this is, this is uh, glass over top of wrinkled uh, tinfoil. Uh, so we built this thing and uh, they carted it all around the province showing people soliciting support uh, for this project. This is a sketch we did for it. And here it is under construction. And there it is. Uh, this is uh, in Ontario Place, the skating rink. This is the, this, the silos behind. And uh, it's still there today, interestingly. Uh, a temporary exhibit uh, has outlasted pretty much everything else on the island. Uh, we did a number of sort of studies as well. This is a series of high-rise buildings that were proposed for St. Thomas. But I put this, put this up just to show how dated the graphics look. And I, I always wonder how anything really, how every, anything really got built back then. Uh, we would take the architect's drawings and lay them down, put tracing paper over top and trace the outline of the site. When you think about what happens on paper in terms of stretching and shrinking and, and the air of a little bit this way, a little bit that way, and then um, we develop our landscape plans and off we go and build them. Uh, none of the accuracy that, uh, that we are able to achieve today uh, with, with digital technology. We moved our office shortly to this building. This is on Waterloo Street on the south side of the tracks. We were here just a short time and then ended up here on Princess Ave. Uh, I, I stayed here for about three years. We hired uh, Jim Vafiatis, uh, worked for us in this office. This actually was a light pole from the Peace Bridge in Fort Erie. Uh, my dad was able to secure that. We restored it and I put it at the office. And then when I left the office, Dave said uh, that I could take that with me, but then he sold the building and the new owner wouldn't let me have it. So if you go by there, that's my lamppost. <laughs> I planted that uh, Japanese maple. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, there were some faculty members at Fanshawe College who um, wanted to take summer holidays. And so they approached me and said, uh, this is in 1980, so I was out of school a year and a half. And they said, uh, would you replace these faculty in the summer and teach some courses for us? And I said, oh, teaching. I never thought about that. Uh, that might be fun to do. So I took the summer and, uh, and taught students there. This is one of my first classes. We weren't actually on the main campus. We were in an industrial building on First Street, uh, just down the way. Uh, you may recognize this person. That's Martha Burkins. She was one of my students back then. And uh, after I finished my first year, the other students went to the dean and said, hire this guy. And there was no advertisement in the paper, no interviews. The dean called me in and said, would you like to work here? And I said, that was sort of fun. Yeah, maybe for five years. That sounds like something I'll do. And uh, that's what I did. I had the privilege of working with uh, Sylvia Bear. She came to Fanshawe two years after I left, or I, I started, sorry. And this man, Howard Falls, he was an architect. And when I arrived, there were no landscape people involved in the program. They had an architect, Howard Falls, and a person who was a botanist who had a specialty in banana culture. And uh, this is why I think the students felt that maybe somebody who had a business background <laughs> and was involved in landscape would be better. And over that period of time, I didn't spend five years. I spent 31 years there teaching. Over 2,000 students. 
I started a semester in Italy where the students could spend uh, the semester in, in Italy touring gardens there. I started the horticulture program, uh, Fan Chow's first applied degree, a Bachelor of Environmental Design and Planning. I developed an articulation agreement with the University of Guelph, so graduates from the landscape program at Fanshawe would go directly into the third year of the degree program at the University of Guelph. Uh, I got the campus designated as an arboretum. It was an embarrassment to be at Fanshawe. The grounds looked awful. And when people would come and say, you're in the landscape program at Fanshawe, the landscape there is, is terrible. Uh, when Barry Moore was there, I was able to convince Barry to designate the whole campus as an arboretum. And then we proceeded to landscape it. And now uh, parents come and say, this campus looks so beautiful. If this is how you treat your grounds, I'm sure you're gonna treat my, stu my student, your, my kid, uh, with respect as well. Uh, I was able to speak to Matt Cuddy's uh, widow and uh, was able to secure the Cuddy Gardens of Strathroy as a research and training center uh, for Fanshawe. I did a lot of the Ontario skills competitions. This is one of my teams and our coach. We won many provincial and national championships uh, with, our, with our teams. Well, then I, uh, I'm teaching and I'm working for David. I'm working about 90 hours a week. My deal with David was you give me 40 hours a week and the rest of the time you can do what you like. So I'm teaching during the day, working all night. Meanwhile, my wife is starting a medical practice and we started having children. Things were a little hectic. Uh, but I decided I'm going to leave David and start my own practice. So this is our logo at the time. And I was working out of my house uh, up by Thames Valley Golf Course. My brother happened to be a graphic designer, so he developed our new logo. And the idea was we would sort of create this image of a tree arising from a plan or a computer kind of generated graphic. Uh, we sold the house in Hayden Ridge and moved here on Wellington Street, just uh, north of St. Joe's Hospital, north of Victoria. And uh, my office was right inside the front door there initially. Then we moved to the attic, took over the attic. Then we moved to the basement and took over the whole basement this is how we were drafting T squares, set squares, circle templates, which are doing trees and circle templates. And I got the idea that maybe we should buy a computer. 1984, the best computer I could get was an XT. It was roaring fast with two <laughs> floppy drives, a monochrome screen, because you could get a color screen, but any diagonal line, you only could get eight colors, but the diagonal lines would be like ladders stepping down. So I thought, well, we'll go with a monochrome screen, monochrome screen, 128K of RAM and 10 megabits white hard drive and AutoCAD version three. And my concept at the time was, this is gonna be fantastic because I can just take a disk from the architect and put it in my computer, lay in my landscape. I don't have to draft all the base plan and everything and, uh, and then hand the disk back with the landscape in it. But I was the only one with a computer, nobody else. <laughs> bought one. So I'm sitting there with my computer, spending time on training and, you know, you, you can imagine my, my, uh, my eyes squinting at the screen. Uh, but eventually it came true. And, you know, long, long comes the internet and, and now what I thought would happen in 1984 uh, actually is the way we practice today. I bought all that for $12,000. Yeah, it was insane. $12,000 in 1984, what would that be worth now? 35 million in that range, yeah. And along come these two people, uh, Martha Berkman's and Barry. Barry's at Joanne's here today. And you know, I'm gonna present some projects for you to look at. Uh, I don't want you to get the wrong idea. This is not me, this is our team. This, I, have, I have two fantastic people who have worked with me right from the beginning, both were my students. And uh, I'd like to say I identified uh, that these would be uh, you know, wonderful designers, and we would stay together forever. Who knows? But I was thinking at the time, but uh, but that's what happened. Um, and uh, I I couldn't be in the business without these two people. Well, uh, my neighbors started complaining about the activity at our house. If you know Wellington, um, you know Dick Ivy lives next door, and it's a she she neighborhood. And there are lots of cars and people coming in and out. They complained to the city, so the city made me move and buy another building on Oxford Street. And Dick Ivey lived here. This is the garden that I showed you earlier that I designed. And uh, Dick wanted to downsize. So he bought my house, which was here, 
tore it down, built his house, and then did a little infill. My yard was all of this. We had a little over an acre in the back here. So he um, developed it. And while this was happening, I haven't talked about some of the construction companies I started, but I had a construction, landscape construction company called Wellington Gardens. That's what he ended up naming the street. I thought that was sort of coincidental. So this is where we moved to and where we are today, 368 Oxford Street. We have the upper two floors. And uh, now we have uh, six landscape architects and a support team, three arborists, and uh, um, working all over the world. So with that in mind, um, I asked my staff, I never looked at this before, to add up how many projects we've done in my 40 years of practice. It's about 100 projects a year. So a little over 4,000 projects that we've completed um, in that period of time, including the fountain and the pathway through here and lots of work around here in Labatt Park. And there aren't many parts of London that we haven't touched in, in the course of my, my time. So what I thought I'd do is maybe just quickly go through some residential gardens to show you. I looked at our, our job list and this rumination was an interesting experience. I've been feeling very nostalgic as a result. But uh, in the first portion of our career, of my career, about 80% of the work I did was residential gardens. And as my career progressed, that became less and less a percentage of the total. And now it's probably reversed. About 80% of the work we do is larger scale uh, type work, hospitals, um, high-rise parking buildings, subdivision designs, streetscapes, downtowns. Um, I'll show you some of that work. And about 20% is what I would call estate residential. So these are some of the estate residentials. This is one that Barry did. This is a little Asian garden that we put together backing on the Thames River. Another one. Lots of swimming pools. And uh, this is backing onto a natural area. Greenhouses. This is actually, uh, we had some problems with this one. The, um, the fountain started to leak and uh, we took it apart and took it apart, couldn't figure out what was going on. This whole thing has a liner, a rubber liner underneath it to hold the water in place. And uh, eventually we just took this whole middle section out and discovered that mice had gotten underneath and were eating holes in the, uh, in the rubber. Uh, so now we've got to put, uh, traps out to catch them uh, so they don't get under the waterfall. And this is an interesting project. Uh, Paul Skinner approached me and said, uh, we've got this street, McKellar Street. This is down by the Thames Valley Golf Course as you come down Sunny Hill Road. And he said, I'm going to sell these lots with two conditions. One, I have to do the design for the house. And two, you have to do the design for the landscape. And so we developed a landscape strategy for the whole community. And you can't see where the property boundaries are. The landscape rolls from one site to the next. And they have one maintenance company that maintains the whole thing. So it's like they're living in a park. And the backyards are your private spaces. Do what you like in the backyards, but the fronts were all uh, controlled in that way. Uh, this is one that Barry worked on. Uh, the Cancer Survivors Garden. You know, this is the land that uh, was it a biker house at one time, and uh, then Siftings took it over, had a proposal here, and then through negotiations gave it gave it as a park to the city. The house was torn down. We kept the remnants of it, and then built a p pavilion. And the garden uh, was sponsored by the Home Builders Association, and the intent is to celebrate those who survived cancer. Uh, so when you when you're cancer free, this is a place to celebrate that. And we've been planting tons of daffodils uh, the, in honor of that. The UTRC head office this is one of the first uh, projects we did with uh, Platinum Lee uh, certification. Rexall Drugstore is a gateway uh, to the neighborhood. We've done a lot of work at the university, thanks to some of the people here at Brescia College, Ontario Hall. And uh, we've just been retained to do the pedestrian connection systems, Ontario Street, the main spine, 
redoing all of that, and uh, the pathway going up the hill, looking at all of that. Kent Lane, redoing that. So we're just, uh, just now at our first meeting this week, uh, developing strategies to basically reshape the landscape that defines uh, Western. King's College. Great garden spaces there. We've done a lot of work in uh, mental health. In St. Thomas, this is the meditation garden with the labyrinth. Uh, and for the, this is an interesting project because it, it's a forensic facility. So we're designing gardens for the criminally insane and having to think about what could become a weapon, uh, how might they escape, you know, that kind of thing. This is the LMPS station in St. Thomas that we worked on and redeveloped all that space. The courthouse in St. Thomas, that's the original courthouse and worked on the, on the new building and reshaping the landscape here. The, we're doing a lot of work in seniors care for a number of the major providers. Uh, this is a particular project for the Schlegel family and uh, Cornerstone has been working with this for a long time. Uh, St. Joe's Hospital. My wife was on the St. Joe's staff for many years. All our kids were born here. And so it's been a lot of fun watching the changes that are happening there. And this is the, the garden at the corner where the um, original foundation of the, of the original building there was preserved. And then we added these screens around the outside with vines growing on them to emulate the, the fenestration of the, of the original structure. Mental health in London. Thinking about uh, circular pathways and uh, creating gardens that are sympathetic to the needs of people with dementia and mental health issues. Uh, we've been working at the Jack Minor Bird Sanctuary. I'm surprised how few people know who Jack Minor, Minor was. He was really the first ecologist uh, and saved the Canada goose from extinction. I'm not sure how many people are happy about that now, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, interesting story, uh, Jack Miner was friends with Henry Ford, and Ford was enamored uh, of, of what Miner was trying to do to save the goose. And when the Canada goose was migrating uh, over Jack Miner's site out in, uh, in Kingsville, uh, the sky would be black for three days straight. Hundreds of thousands of geese would fly over his property. And Ford saw this and thought, this is really neat, and gave uh, Miner the money to make a movie of that experience. And Miner took that movie around the world. He filled Royal Bird Hall with 8,000 people who all paid a quarter each to see this movie. Did you, you know, back in the early 20s, a movie was a big deal. And uh, this was sort of a, uh, an environmental amazing thing. So all kinds of people showed up. The money that Miner raised helped him to establish a foundation and, and, to, um, and to pursue uh, his objectives of, of conservation and protection. Really interesting Canadian story. Uh, down the street, we've been working on a number of wineries, including this one, the Oxley Winery, uh, which has become so successful that we have parking problems on the site now. So I'm supposed to go down next week and try to figure out how we can uh, accommodate the parking. I think we're going to have to take grapevines out in order to get the, get the cars onto the site. Uh, the little London sign that you see downtown was a fun little project we did with the city. We did the 3M corporate head offices um, and naturalized both this site and the uh, uh, Oxford Street site. On both sites, we, uh, we got school kids there and worked with the Conservation Authority and planted 50 acres of trees on both sites. Uh, then uh, these were like little, little seedlings. If you go there now, the problem is kids are going out and camping uh, in the trees. Um, because the trees have grown up so large. The idea that we presented to 3M at the time and was accepted by the corporate head office was that by planting trees uh, to that extent, we would uh, neutralize or I guess balance the impact of the facility on the community and the cars needed to get to the, the plant. So really looking at sustainability uh, way back then. This project was entered into the uh, National Post Design Awards and uh, we won the national award for for that concept uh, back in the uh, early 90s. Gibbons Park Bridge, worked with a firm out of Toronto in the design of this and the landscape around it. You remember they used to have a bridge that pulled across and pulled back onto the ground in the wintertime. 
Uh, so we worked on that. Uh, Loblaw, uh, the first store we did for Loblaw was Masonville Mall. Just remember, they used to be in the mall and they moved across the street. And they approached us to prepare a landscape plan. And Barry and I looked at this and said, uh, you know, how much money we got to spend on the landscape? And they said, we got about forty to 50000 And uh, we thought, on a site this size, you won't see it. I mean, that's not enough money to do a good job. Uh, so we said, well, you know, give us a reasonable budget and we'll do a landscape that will be attractive. They said, well, how much do you need? How much do we spend, Barry? Quarter of a million? 300000 So they gave us $300,000. We did the landscape. On the, on the idea of that the shopping experience begins as you arrive at the site, not at the moment you walk in the front door. Uh, we finished the landscape. This was the number one store in the Loblaws chain. They were making a million dollars a week uh, out of the store. Uh, and so this real estate team said, maybe there's something into this idea about quality landscapes. And we started doing stores for them all over Canada now. Uh, pretty much everything outside of Core Toronto, uh, Barry's been working on. And uh, they've been a great client for us. And then they bought Shoppers Drug Mart. And now we're working on a lot of their shopper sites to uh, maximize uh, their rental. And then they roll those buildings into uh, the Western REIT. Uh, interesting approach. The McCormick home. Uh, interesting story here. There are two big oak trees. You see one of them here that were slated for demolition or removal uh, because of the sewer services and some of the construction work. And we worked with Richard and uh, and uh, re relocated things and were able to keep those two huge oak trees, uh, which now add a lot of quality uh, to the back of the building. On this side, uh, we've done a series of uh, uh, therapy gardens specifically designed uh, for the needs of Alzheimer's patients who, who come here for day programs. And they, they've been very successful. Uh, St. Mary's Hospital, the uh, perimeter, as well as the roof garden. So this garden sits on top of the loading docks and storage areas underneath. And they were designed also uh, for uh, patients to stroll around and, and to um, provide some horticultural therapy. The gardens have been so popular uh, that there have been there have been overuse issues. Uh, now they have planters that are assigned to a, a, a patient there, and there's so many planters around there. They're uh, running out of room. Uh, this, this, this is such a popular place to go. This is an interesting project. Uh, Barry and I were approached by the town of Amherstburg, and we did a uh, sort of a brainstorming session with them. And basically, the planner said, what could we do here to improve our parks and our, our, our whole sort of landscape experience? And we noodled around. Barry came up with some really interesting ideas. And they said, well, what do you think that would cost? And we said, mm, about $14 million, something like that. And they went gray, uh, a little town like Amherstburg. Where are they going to find $14 million? Uh, so they took our drawings. And unbeknownst to us, they sent them as an, a funding application to the government. And in November, we got a call. that They, based, they said, you know what? We got $14 million. Uh, the only condition is we have to spend it by March. And this is, it was in October, November. We're thinking, you know, how do we make this happen? We'll put tents up. Fortunately, it was a pretty mild winter and uh, we got it done. We got the whole thing built. I'll show you what we built. We built these, two of these, the Navy Park. This is the other side of Navy Park, right on the river. Amherst Park, Amherstburg Park here the big walking trail and the, and the storm pond and the information center, along with a couple streets, the high school. What else did we do? There was a lot, yeah. We, we got it all done and they got their money. And it, it's made a huge difference to, uh, to this little community. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Amica, this building was under construction and I got a call from the mayor uh, Ron, could you meet with our, our engineering team? Uh, the building permit was let, but the engineers hadn't given clearance on how the stormwater was going to get around this building from the storm ponds down into the Medway. And so we had to think of some way to creatively accommodate that drainage. 
and uh, we came up with uh, really interesting solutions in the landscape that surrounds us. When you drive by Intentional Park Road, you'll see all of this. It has uh, exercise centers. There's a Cortan Steel Bridge crosses over the the, uh, the stream that comes from the Storm Pond, and uh, it's a nice space. The London Fire Department. Uh, we did a lot of work at the Boys and Girls Club. A, little, a nook shook that's built in the uh, corner there. Oh. I broke your pointer, sorry, Marzio. <laughs> uh, my, my, I have four brothers, and uh, the next oldest brother, Rick, was on the roof uh, on a hot summer's day, and he got dizzy and fell off the roof. They rushed him to the hospital. And they said it was just heat stroke or something. They took him home, and he stood, stayed there for a couple of days. And then his eyes started acting weird, pointing in different directions. One eye rotating one way, the other eye rotating another way. And they thought, maybe this is more than just heat stroke. They rushed him to a hospital in Hamilton, and uh, they did some testing and found that he had a, an AVI. It's a, uh, a cluster of blood vessels in the brain that had ruptured, and his brain was encased in blood. Uh, the neurologist in Hamilton said uh, he went into a coma, and they said, uh, you know, make, make plans for saying goodbye. Uh, my wife uh, and I went there, and uh, my wife said, I, I can't accept this. So she walked into the radiology department and got a white lab coat, put it on, took all the x-rays, and we jumped in the car and we drove to University Hospital. We met with this man. Uh, Charlie Drake and, and Dr. Ferguson, and we said, uh, is there anything you can do? And they said, this is pretty serious, but we think we can make an impact. We drove back to Hamilton. My brother is still in a coma, and uh, my sister-in-law would not release him to our care because the surgeons there said, those, you know, those uh, cowboys in London, they'll just experiment on him, and you'll be stuck with a vegetable for the rest of your life. So she wouldn't let it happen. Uh, Rick came out of the coma just briefly, and he said, I said, where am I? What's going on? I said, here's the story, Rick. He signed the papers. We air ambulanced him to London. Uh, Charlie operated on him. Uh, three operations, 32 hours of microsurgery. If you met my brother today, you wouldn't realize that all this had happened. Uh, Charlie saved my brother's life. And so it was a real honor to be able to work with the team in creating the memorial to Charles Gray in front of University Hospital. And uh, this sculpture was done by one of his students. And this is actually a device uh, that he invented. And the royalties from the use of that go to medical care. And these, these are all the students that he taught, all the neurologists that he taught over the years. The London Civic Garden Center. There's another view. This was done first, and then we did the gardens on the other side. A popular place for wedding photos now. Uh, at Blake Park, we're doing a lot of work in skate park and spray pad design all over. You know, people are getting away from uh, lifeguard requirements, and uh, with spray pad, you don't have that. Goodwill, uh, we planted these ginkgos out here. Michelle protested that they were too small, and we said, Michelle, just wait. They're going to be, they're going to grow. And they look great now, and they've survived. Most other plants probably would have succumbed to the growth conditions. We did a lot of work at the Hunt Club over the years. This is the tennis facility. Sisters of St. Joe's facility, which again uh, was sort of the leading edge, one of the earliest green rooms and infiltration, LID kind of approaches. The sisters were very progressive uh, in their expectations about the landscape. Now we've uh, followed up and done some work uh, because now the Lung Hospice has moved here as well. Station Park, one of the first green roofs in London. People don't realize this is over the parking garage. Um, Trudell Medical, uh, Mitch Barron wanted a, a pond and waterfalls on an industrial site. Uh, the city selected us to work on the Veterans Memorial Parkway. Uh, this is the first Gateway feature that we put in, this rock, uh, 65 tons. And we had to build this huge socket in concrete underneath to drop this thing into. 
it looks like it belongs there now, but you don't realize how much infrastructure is necessary to put a piece like that in. Solid granite, uh, and it's granite that's cleaved from the quarry rather than blasted. Uh, blasting creates micro fissures uh, that then absorb water and the rock disintegrates over time. So this, this will, will be there forever. And you'll see these all along the way. The concept was, rather than to celebrate war, was to uh, put landscape features along the highway that evoke positive images of the sacrifice uh, that was made on our behalf. And when we presented this to council, one of the council members said, it's interesting because those are the same attributes, those same characteristics that we value as a community. So people driving in, seeing words like courage and freedom and fortitude, it says something about us and the things that we hold to be important. I thought that was an interesting spin on uh, what we've done. Uh, we've been working with um, the city and doing planting. So you've probably seen all the trees that we've planted alongside. That's all been done with volunteers and at a very inexpensive uh, approach to the, um, to the planting. But the idea is that as the trees grow, we'll eventually create a forest experience as you drive into the city. The, the origin of that was actually uh, um, Hank Vanderland at uh, Trojan, who said he would pick up clients at the airport and bring them to his plant. And he was embarrassed for them to see what the, what the landscape looked like. So it was Hank's idea that really got this whole thing going. Uh, this is another one of Barry's projects, the Battle of the Atlantic. Uh, very few people know that the Battle of the Atlantic was the longest battle of the war. And thousands and thousands of Canadians died, uh, making sure that food and supplies uh, kept going from North America uh, to Europe to, to support our troops there. Uh, in the Battle of the Atlantic, these are the monuments. Each monument depicts a ship and its name uh, that was sunk uh, during the battle. Uh, so we created uh, these pathways that provide access to that, these retaining walls and staircases that come down and uh, created a whole interesting park experience uh, along, the, along the river. Uh, I started talking about how important uh, the Canadian military has been to me. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for them. Uh, so whenever we get asked to do gardens like this, I, I, I say yes right away and often we do them for no, no charge. Uh, this is the St. Thomas Veterans Garden. These, these memorials were scattered all over town, and we brought them all together and created this, uh, this garden experience, and then added uh, a statue to the Afghanistan um, engagement as well. Uh, I should say we're also working on the Highway of Heroes, the 401 link from Trenton to the coroner's office in Toronto. Uh, the Stony Creek Community Center, where the YMCA is. Um, we won a number of awards with uh, Richard Hammond and Cornerstone on this. This courtyard was intended to, to be skateboard friendly so that uh, young people could go out and, and skate here as well. We've done a lot of work with the city on <coughs> islands and uh, street tree preservation to make sure that the vegetation adjacent to the roadway uh, will survive when new sewers or water mains or new road construction happens. A lot of work at Fanshawe College. I mentioned uh, we had a designated visit arboretum and a lot of these gardens that you see there were designed in collaboration with the students and then we'll go out and install them with the students as well. Sugar Creek Park. This is an interesting project we did with the city and Old Oak uh, where we created the park and built it in advance of the homes. And the city property actually runs through here. So some of the gardens uh, and the patio next to the restaurant here, next to the cafe, are actually on city land. And the agreement is that the owner will maintain the garden. So rather than sending the city there to clean the garbage cans and sweep everything up, remove the snow, that kind of thing, the owner has the benefit of the use of the space. And rather than putting a fence, you know, separating the two, uh, they formed a collaborative relationship. And that model now is starting to get more and more popular. We're doing more parks uh, in, in that same fashion. Another fire station in Windsor. Uh, we're the landscape architects now for six boards of education in Ontario. And what we're primarily doing is developing nature playgrounds, uh, creating 
uh, environments that are evocative of uh, natural experiences. If you think about your own play experiences as children, probably the most memorable ones did not involve teeter-totters or slides or climbers. It probably was building a fort in the forest or a tree house or a raft or something where you're engaging in a creative way uh, with the environment around you. And so uh, that's what we're doing uh, and working with uh, uh, the faculty, the teachers, and the curriculum to create these play experiences uh, that are uh, inexpensive uh, and really safe. So the, uh, you know, whenever a child is injured on a playground, there has to be an incident report. And the incident reports on these playgrounds is like zero. Uh, very, very few in injuries happen. And yet, you know, these things that look like stoves and uh, refrigerators and, you know, climbers with things hanging on posts and uh, kids love them. We developed uh, all of the entrance gateways and the landscape themes for the Sunningdale subdivision. The Blackburn Fountain uh, is one of my favorite projects that we did. Uh, we not only developed the design for the fountain itself, uh, but also the grounds here. I cited the fountain so that it sprays directly towards the King Street Bridge here. So as you walk across the pedestrian bridge, the fountain sprays towards you. And then the major arch, this arch, if you stand on the bridge in Highbury, exactly frames Dundas Street. So you're looking back the other way. Uh, the fountain was designed uh, to run in the wintertime. So uh, it draws water from a pipe that runs under the river to a point right here. My wife and I got in a canoe and paddled out. I dropped the measuring tape down until we found the deepest spot. And then we ran a pipe uh, from here. It's a big two and a half inch, a two and a half foot pipe that comes out and flows backwards into a huge chamber under the fountain. Inside the chamber is a screen that prevents fish from getting into the pumps because uh, we didn't want to have sushi spraying out of the fountain. And uh, uh, two hundred horsepower sewer pumps, sewage pumps that drive this. One that does the major jet, which goes. Uh, almost 200 feet in the air, and the other that drives the other jets, the smaller jets here. <coughs> the inspiration for this came from Geneva. The Blackburns, Martha and Walter, were in Geneva and saw this out in Lake Geneva. And when they came back to the city, they donated half a million dollars to the city to build a jet d'eau in the Thames River. What they didn't realize was Lake Geneva is pretty stable in terms of its water elevation. The Thames River goes up 14 feet and drops back down again. Uh, in fact, when we were building the fountain, we had to watch the weather reports, and if there was rain forecast in the next two days, all the construction had to come out of the river. Drove the contractor crazy, because uh, we had to find these narrow little windows that we could rush out and do the work and come back in again. Uh, and the technical work was done by Dan Usher. Uh, Dan is a, a specialist in fountain design. He just finished the spectacular fountains at the, at the World Trade Center in New York. And he goes all over the world. So Dan did the, the plumbing design for us on the, uh, on the fountain. I did some work on a university campus in China. This is me working in China. Um, uh, a friend of mine sent me this notice and said, are you interested in doing some work in China? I said, oh, that sounds like fun. Yeah, sure. So he submitted my name. They called me and said, uh, could you send some freehand sketches? And I, I said, well, when do you need them? Like right now. So I got some freehand sketches I did, like this kind of stuff, for a client this morning. I just scanned them. They said, but look, if you want formal images, we, we would use SketchUp or 3D Studio Max or something to do something really nice. No, 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 no. Send us freehand sketches. So I did. And then they called me and said, well, we've selected you for the job. And I said, that's wonderful. Yeah, you were the best of the people we interviewed. And I said, I didn't realize it was a competition. Uh, why did you select me? And they said, well, there are 30 people, 30 men on the review committee. None of them speak English. And when we talk to you, we're talking through a translator. And we want you to respond immediately. And by drawing, we can see that you're understanding what we're asking for. Uh, so there you go for your drawing, got me the job. Uh, so I worked, I went back and forth uh, four times to China. And uh, my wife insisted that I was not to go to the Great Wall or anything like the terracotta soldiers, because we would do that together. 
So after the fourth time, the head honcho uh, in this group of men was fired by the government and the new head honcho wanted his own team. So they had a new architect and new landscape architect. So uh, I didn't go back again. So now I've got to go back to China to see all the things that I missed. Uh, I made a mistake on this job. They asked me what my per diem would be. I gave them my per diem. They picked me up at six o'clock in the morning, worked me till 11 o'clock at night. I didn't tell them how many hours was in the per diem. <laughs> it's just per day, that's what we're paying you per day. And at the end of the time, they would add up my hours, my days, and then uh, they would arrive with an envelope filled with $100 bills. I had a choice of American or Canadian. And I said, okay, uh, isn't it illegal to transfer foreign currency in China? They said, oh yeah, but we're the government. Uh, so where did you get all this money? We just get it on the black market. But if, uh, if there's any counterfeit in there, it, just let us know and we'll replace it. And I, right away I get back to Canada, I hand all this money over to the bank. All of it was good. There was no counterfeit in it. Strange. But what I discovered in working with the Chinese, they, um, they're very, uh, there's, there's a sense of separation between you and them. And once they figure out how you're thinking and what the approach is you're taking, then they don't need you as much anymore. They're, they're happy to dismiss you once, once they know uh, how it works. My job was to design the, um, the campus for this new university in Tianjin that was supposed to attract European and North American academics. And they didn't feel confident that they could design the, the campus in a North American style that would attract people uh, from here. So that, that's what my job was. Um, early in our time, uh, Bernie Zaithman gave me a call and said, uh, we're going to have a competition run. Uh, we hope you'd be interested in participating. We're going to give you a site plan. You develop the landscape plan for it, and we'll compare it to your competitors. And if we like yours, then we're going to use you for the rest of our projects. Well, Zed Group was just sort of getting started then. They weren't what they became. And uh, um, Barry and I and Martha looked at each other and said, are we going to do this? We're busy. I said, let's, let's just do it. What, what can be lost? So uh, we submitted our drawing. Nobody else did. Nobody else uh, took the bait. So Bernie hired us, and we did all the Zed Group's work from then on. And uh, there were dozens of them. And every year we had an interesting meeting. Bernie would travel uh, around the U.S. getting ideas for housing projects. And uh, we would have this sort of creative session where he'd say, I'm looking at what my competitors are doing. I want to do something different. What can we do that would distinguish our product from our competitors? And we came up with the idea of uh, putting the super mailbox in a gazebo and uh, you know, designing the, the gateways and all kinds of interesting little quirky things that, that distinguish Z Group's projects from everybody else. As a result of all this work, Bernie and I became good friends. There's Bernie there and his family. Uh, most of you know that he passed away a few years ago. Parkinson's claimed him, but he's a great guy. And uh, we, we're really thankful for all the work and trust he gave us. Spring Bank Park, uh, a lot of things at Spring Bank uh, over the years that we did this big staircase. We did the historical uh, master plan for it and uh, uh, a lot of work along the, uh, in, in, in the uh, Wonderland Gardens. You know, the big tower at the back with slide thing. I was the first one to go down it. Um, I developed quite a charge when it came out. Sparks blew out of my finger. Uh, this is the project I'm working on in Barbados right now, uh, beach houses. Uh, my wife and I invested in a hotel in Barbados in 1986, and uh, it's called the Crane on the uh, on the cliff. Do you know the Crane? My character there. Oh, is that right? Yes. My wife and I invested with a group of investors from Toronto, but there are only 18 rooms. Uh, it's on the on the ocean side, away from the main touristy areas, and this is where Mick Jagger and Keith Richards would stay. Loretta Swit, you remember? Hot Lips who will a hand from, from MASH would stay there because it was sort of isolated. But it was hard to run a business with just 18 rooms. And uh, we decided to convert it to timeshare and began to expand. Now it's 300 rooms with five restaurants and uh, Deb and I have just built a, a home on the grounds, a condo. 
the thing is, once you build these enterprises, you've got all this um, training that you've you know, invested in the, in the uh, well, we have our own nursery, we grow all our own plants, uh, we have our own electricians and masons and engineers and architectural team. Uh, so we're sort of running out of things for them to do because that development's finishing up. So the, the team has purchased this property up the beach, one of those beautiful sites in the world, and uh, we're building these 3,000 square foot, one floor green roof homes right on the water. Uh, and the gardens are designed so that the sides of the house open up. And, the, and this is the bathroom, so you're sort of having a bath in the garden kind of thing. Uh, we call these uh, no tan line gardens. Right, you get the idea. <laughs> Uh, well, in addition to the work we've been doing, uh, I've also felt a need to give back to our community. Um, and Tom knows that the two of us sit on the foundation board at the Grand Theater. I also sit on the operating board. I'm the president of the foundation board. And I've been there since, well, it's been 16 years now that I've been working with the Grand. We're just embarking now on a major renovation project, $8 million redoing the front of house. And uh, uh, I'm very active in my church, Metropolitan United, across from City Hall. I sit on the Elden House board, and uh, we have some ideas about the back to the river and how Elden House can be reconnected to the river down the slope and, uh, and to develop a, a, a horticultural destination in the downtown by using that land. Uh, talking to Mr. Fari about the land next door, maybe acquiring some of the floodplain that he owns and incorporating that back into uh, the Harris's estate. I sit on many boards of Landscape Ontario. In fact, I was there this afternoon uh, working with them and promoting our industry. Uh, Landscape architects are pursuing a practice act right now. Um, right now we have a title act. In other words, you can't call yourself a landscape architect unless you're a member of the association, but anybody can do landscape architecture. Uh, so the, the hope is that the, that the province will uh, recognize the need to designate landscape architecture work as uh, distinctive and only for lands qualified landscape architects. And I sit on the National Standards Committee, so we're, we've just completed uh, the new National Standard for Landscape Installation uh, for the whole country. And uh, the intent is that rather than you know, outlining everything that, that uh, is necessary to consider in the construction of a garden, you just refer to this document. And just finish putting that together. And I said on this board, uh, Sustainable Development Technology of Canada, SDTC, this is a board of, of the federal government and uh, Jim Balsilli, the gentleman that invented the blackberries, our chair, it's a, it's a Canada-wide board. And we invest your money, Canadian taxpayer money, in emerging clean technology in an effort to secure that innovation for Canadians, our jobs and, uh, and our future. And so far, we've invested a little over $2.2 billion uh, on your behalf. Um, I now sit on the Program Review Committee, so it's a fantastic opportunity to see the great innovation that Canadians are developing. And you know, you hear the news and we're going to hell in a handbasket kind of thing, and you get a little bit despondent. And then you see some of the game changer technologies that are really coming down the pipe uh, and, and will you know, have a huge impact on the, our quality of life in the future. That's a, that's a wonderful board to be on. I've also been involved in Communities in Bloom. We won the uh, um, regional award and then we won the national award. Of course, this is when Anne-Marie was mayor. And I'm a founding director of Reforest London. Um, the idea that uh, we want to plant trees and, uh, and help, help the environment in London. As Tom mentioned in last year, I was inducted as a fellow in the CSLA. It's the highest honor that can be given to a landscape architect, except for what this guy got. This is George Dart, who was a classmate of mine, and George just won the Governor General's Award, uh, which is pretty amazing. So after all that, Roy Bonnesteel, you remember Man Alive? They went and interviewed uh, my son at the Montessori School. And uh, Roy Bonnesteel said to my son, what does your mother do, young man? Like he's five years old. Oh, my mother's a doctor and she makes people well. 
That's nice. What's your father do? My son pondered this for a while, and he said, my dad, he mows the lawn. <laughs> well, thank you. I think we have a moment to take some questions. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes? Do I have a favorite project? Uh, that's a good question. I do, I do love the fountain. Uh, I, I really enjoy going down and just sitting and watching it and seeing people walk by and enjoy it. Uh, the other projects uh, that I get a lot of satisfaction out of are the work we do with seniors. And uh, you know, when I started in practice, we did Parkwood Hospital. And the approach to dementia then was to put a person in a clinical setting. So if they weren't functional, you put them in a room and eventually they would die. And uh, you know, we've really changed our minds or our thinking about how to care for uh, seniors. And I, I really enjoy an opportunity to make a difference in people's lives uh, where now families can come and meet you know, their loved ones in a, in a comfortable, relaxing setting uh, where, where the resident is, is more themselves. They're not agitated. You know, they, um, they, they then re recall them in a lucid. And, and I think the research is showing that it slows down the progression of the dementia. So, you know, when you work in a residential backyard, it feels a little bit, you know, insignificant. You know, I'm doing expensive gardens for wealthy people who probably have cottages and travel and don't spend much time in the garden anyway. And uh, like swimming pools, like there's no economic foundation to support a swimming pool. Uh, they're just hugely expensive to maintain and careful. It's about lifestyle, it's about enjoyment. I, I get that. But when you can create something that really makes people's lives better, that's very fulfilling. Yeah. Richard. Uh, how has your palate changed, you know, as uh, you know, the more you've been practicing? Because there was, there was about the same time that we had invasive species take over and, you know, the Louisiana ash tree was taking over. How yeah. has that changed? Is it getting better or is it becoming trickier to find the right kind of species? It is, it is getting trickier. Now, you have to remember our palate here in southern Ontario compared to the rest of Canada is huge, probably over 6,000 plants that we have access to that we could use in the gardens. And so, yeah, there have been some, ash was a, a big part of our planting programs for many, many years, and now they're all gone, basically. Um, there's a, a disease that's affecting oak, um, oak wilt, that's coming from the States. It's in Detroit now, and we're on guard watching for this, make sure that if we see it, that we deal with it quickly. So, yeah, it really has changed our, our view but we've moved away from monoculture. We've, we're moving away from this notion, like when you look at our drawings, we draw circles and we draw them two-dimensionally. And when the plants get planted, uh, there's air and open space between the plantings. So what do we do? We mulch that in order to deter weeds and hold moisture in the ground. So our approach is really evolving right now to be more three-dimensional, a ground layer that acts as a mulch and then plants that naturally grow through that to create a mid-layer, and then taller plants that rise above that poses some challenges in how you draw that. Uh, but we're sort, of, we're sort of working through that now. Uh, but that's sort of where the industry is going today, much more of an ecological approach and, and working in big drifts uh, rather than individuals. Uh, when I started in the nurseries as a boy, the most popular plants were skyrocket junipers, <laughs> for Scythias, beauty bushes, and, and burning bush. We still do a little bit of burning bush. Nobody in the right mind will plant the others. Uh, Austrian pine that I mentioned earlier in Norway maple. Uh, Norway maple is prohibited in the city now. I can't plant Norway maple in the city, uh, mainly because, well, we did the tree inventories. Our firm did the tree inventories for London, Mississauga, Woodstock, Stratford, Brantford, over a million trees. Uh, working with my students at Fanshawe. And uh, what we found was 30% of the trees on streets in Ontario are Norway maples. Not accidentally, they are survivors. 
they grow well there. Uh, but now we're moving away from that because the Norway maple is invasive and the seeds are displacing native trees from, from the, uh, the natural areas. So we're looking for alternatives. Uh, although this morning I was in Toronto talking about Bloor Street and the $25 million they spent on developing a landscape solution on Bloor in Toronto and then went ahead and planted native trees, uh, Kentucky coffee tree and uh, lemon plane tree. They all died uh, because native trees grew in a forest setting and Bloor Street is anything but. Uh, so really, I think planting natives is the preferred approach, but you've got to look carefully at where the plant is going and make the right choice so that they'll survive and provide all the other benefits um, that, that, that plants can provide. So uh, go downtown Beijing and what do you see? Ginkgos everywhere. Uh, they're survivors. Uh, no insects or diseases affect them. And uh, one of the oldest known plants, they're, they're one of the few plants we have fossilized evidence of. Uh, so, you know, if you're, if you're dealing with really tough locations, like we saw some of the planters that were putting on York Street between, you know, two lanes of traffic and either way and salt spray and carbon monoxide and everything that happens there, the ginkgos are doing great. Uh, 